This is Behind the Headlines with behind-the-scenes analysis on issues affecting Pennsylvanians, sponsored by the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy. Now, here's your host. Hi, welcome to Behind the Headlines. I'm Charlie Greenewald, Senior Fellow for the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy. I'm joined as usual by my co-host, Mara Donnelly. Mara, welcome. Hello, Charlie. Mara, we're in uh, a different uh, setting today. We, we're, we're, we are. This we're filming on location. Very you, cool. Do you like to tell our viewers where we are? We are at the Yangling Brewery in Pottsville, Pennsylvania. This is very cool. Yes, we are at the oldest brewery uh, continuously operating in America. And we're very fortunate to have with us a very special guest today, and that is Dick Yingling. Dick, welcome to the show. Thank you, sir. Nice to meet you yeah. both. Nice, Dick, nice you, to be here. You are the owner of this um, plant, and uh, you have guided it uh, to whole new heights uh, that the family hadn't realized before. Uh, you are one and probably the, the premier uh, brewery in America today. Well, we're certainly the oldest. I don't know if we're the premier brewery, but we're not the biggest, but we are the oldest. And we've uh, grown tremendously over the last 30 years. I, I bought this from my father in 1985 when he contracted Alzheimer's disease, and, uh, which was unfortunate. And they were, needed somebody to come in and take his place. So I, I bought it. I was in the beer distributing business at that time. And uh, I gladly sold that. And uh, I was in there for 11 years. And I gladly sold it and, and bought the brewery for my dad. And uh, we got very fortunate. Now, you're the oldest brewery. I think you are in the top five in terms of production for American breweries now. Isn't that correct? Uh, it's correct, yes, we are. Uh, there's a lot of people who have gone out of business during my uh, reign at the, at the Yingling Brewery. I go back to 1958 when uh, there was Schmitz and Schaefer and Carling Black Label and Genesee and all these different... I remember all those yeah. Yeah, well, and, well, they're, well, they're all gone. Yeah. And uh, we've survived. Uh, you know, basically, we stayed within ourselves and uh, uh, started really growing back in the late 80s and early 90s. We developed the lager brand, and uh, that's today our, that's our flagship product. It's my favorite, Yingling Lager Light. Thank you. Um, before we get too far into the interview, could you tell our viewers about the, the space that we're in right now? Because it's got a lot of history, and it's just very... I wish everybody could see everything that's in here, but tell about the room we're in. Well, it's, this room was built in uh, around 1930, uh, this whole section of the brewery was added on in 1930, and they built a hospitality suite here. And, and uh, this is where we, we previously used to bring the tours in here. After the tour, we'd bring them in here to uh, sample the different products that we have. We've since moved across the street, and our attendance has exploded over there. We're doing very well at the new, at the new gift shop and museum uh, with the people that want to go through and tour the place. So it's... it's uh, this is still here, and we're going to keep it uh, looking the way it did back in 1930. It, it, it's still on the tour, correct? People well, they look in the door and see, see it, it because right. you can't get 50 people in and out right. of here. There's only one door, you <laughs> yeah. know, so we do what we can with it. Well, Dick, your, it was that your great-great-grandfather was the originator, the founder of the company. Um, and as I ask you off, company, uh, off camera, excuse me, why did he decide to build the brewery in... Um, Pottsville, Pennsylvania. Well, he landed, he came from uh, Wardenburg, Germany, a little town uh, called Aldinger. And uh, we found out that his father, we, we always wondered, not to get ahead of the st uh, question, but we wondered where did he get brewing experience at 21 years old? And we found over there in Aldingen, uh that his father started making beer in 1816. And he was the youngest of, uh, I think, nine children, had no opportunity to. Uh, uh, take over the brewery, and also he didn't want to go in the army. At that time, everybody was fighting with one another, uh, France and Germany, and everybody was fighting, and he didn't want to go in the service, so he got in a clipper ship and came to America and landed in Philadelphia and found that Pottsville was conducive of making beer. Coal was discovered here. Uh, we have very good water supply. We did then, and we still do. Uh, it, it's a mountainous terrain because, of course, there was no electricity and you have to keep beer cold uh, when it's fermented and after for it's fermented. So he had to dig tunnels into the side of the mountain and everything just worked out for him. You know, he had this little brewery on Montunga Street and still, still here today. 
Wow. And that was 1829. That was 1829, and coal had been uh, discovered in this area, anthracite coal, and this area started to grow, and people had to mine the coal. So the Welsh, the uh, Irish, the Germans, uh, so many different nationalities were coming into America, and that was their job, to mine coal. So he had a he had a built-in uh, uh, consumer base with all, with those guys. All, all uh, <laughs> nationalities that are known to uh, to uh, like uh, beer, if I'm yes. not mistaken. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. A lot of a lot of Irish in this area, so <laughs> too. We we didn't drink any beer though. Uh, <laughs> they do now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think they did then too. I'm sure. Um, so th there there's so much history here. It's got to be phenomenal to come from a family that's that has. Um, this much rich, richness behind it and still successful today. Um, what do you think um, has been the greatest accomplishment within the family? I mean, outside of the, the brewery itself. Well, the greatest, uh, everybody was, has been involved. My great, great grandfather started it. His son took it over. There was always, the greatest accomplishment was somebody was always willing to step in and take over the plant. Uh, his son took it over. He passed away in 1899, and my grandfather was a freshman, I think, at Princeton University, and he got called to come home and run the brewery, and I'm not sure that he w was really wanted, he really wanted to do that, but his mother had incurred all the debt for building this thing that was built, a lot of it was built in uh, 1876, so he owed a lot of money on it, and his mother took over the, the debt. So he had to run the brewery, and he ran it until 1985, or 65, uh, 63, when my grandfather passed away. Uh, my father and his brother Dorman took it over, and then I took over in 22 years later. Hard-working family. And all of you have succeeded. Every well, generation we kept has it succeeded. alive. We kept it alive. Uh, it, was, it was on the verge of going out of business in the late 50s. Uh, when my grandfather was still here and then my dad and his brother bought it in 1963 and uh, there wasn't much to we were doing about 70,000 barrels we had a, 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 a lot of a big workforce because everything was done by hand in those days we loaded trucks by hand there was no mechaniz mechanization uh, at that time and and uh, but they kept it alive and that was that's the big thing they put their own money into it to keep it going at that time so many coal region breweries were going out of business. Either a family member didn't want it, it wasn't profitable, and the big breweries were kind of taking over the, the beer business at that time because of the interstate highway system. It was easy to get your beer to market, a lot easier, and they were building breweries more local. It wasn't just Budweiser coming out of St. Louis, it was Budweiser coming out of Newark, New Jersey. So they were, with the power they had, and they still do today, uh, the power they had and the volume of beer that they sold, it was just very difficult to uh, compete against them. And uh, we just did it. Uh, how, I don't know. We just persevered <laughs> and kept kept going. Well, you as a young man uh, coming out of Lycoming College and sort of working around the edges here and then going into your own beer distribution uh, business, you had ideas about modernization here that you were able to finally implement when you took over. And that m paid big dividends, didn't it? Uh, absolutely. It got us more efficient, uh, got more competitive. We could stay competitive with the national brands. And uh, we probably, because of our great, we have a great workforce. Our guys work, uh, work hard, uh, they're smart, they keep the machines going, uh, and they're vi they just run. Up here in Pennsylvania, we have two breweries here in Potts, so and both of them are amongst the most efficient breweries in the United States. We hear that from suppliers, people we buy cartons from, people who buy, we buy glass cans. They say, oh, we never saw, we don't see a plant run like this, and it's all because of our great workforce. Oh, that's great. So, we, I know you get this question a lot. Why Pennsylvania? Why stay in Pennsylvania? Well, we're here, well, because we're the oldest brewery in America, and, and it's here. I've lived, I, our family's lived here for 188 years, so I don't <laughs> yeah. want to go anywhere. I have uh, three of my four children live in Pottsville. Uh, the other daughter lives in, in Reading. Not too far uh, away. Not too far yeah. away, so she commutes back and forth. And, and uh, it was really a great community years ago. It was a fun place to grow up. Uh, the downtown area was vibrant. We had three movie theaters. Uh, restaurants all over the place, bars, uh, don't forget we're not far from Indian Town Gap, 
the, yeah. the soldiers during the Second World War used to come to Pottsville, and they were open 24 hours a day. It has a little, you know, something to it that uh, probably shouldn't have been there, but uh, that's how people made their living back then. It was a mom and pop bar, and the soldiers would stay all night. So this, this town was alive. I worked in a PX in Fort Indian Town Gap when it was still an ROTC training center, and Yingling was the most popular beer among the, uh, among the trainees there. Uh, so I, two shifts a day, three shifts a day, uh, and how many employees do you have here? Uh, there's probably 45, 50 people in this plant. There's probably close to 90 over in the other plant. Uh, this plant produces probably 450,000 barrels in a brewery that was built to originally probably do 200,000 barrels. And uh, we just kept adding on, adding on, putting faster machinery in and uh, uh, economized the operation. And this, this is a, a little money maker. This has, has funded everything that we've done, this little plant. But three uh, shifts a day or two no, shifts we can't, a day? No, we can't make enough beer to do three shifts a day. We, oh. we do about... Uh, 10 hours, sometimes 14 hours a day. We overlap ship shifts. Okay. Uh, we bring extra people in. And uh, the, uh, the other plant runs two 12-hour shifts four days a week, and they get a three-day weekend. Okay. So, and uh, they're very productive over there. They do all the draft beer over there and all the bottle beer. We do all cans here. How many people do you employ at the uh, brewery in Florida? In Florida, somewhere around 110, 120. So let's talk a little bit about uh, Pennsylvania's tax climate. I know you've been vocal in the past about it and probably feel very strongly it could be a, a little bit better. Um, there were two studies recently in the last, uh, within the last couple weeks. One had us ranked at about 23rd in competitiveness. The other one had us in our typical position, which was down at the bottom. So tell us wh what your feeling is about P Pennsylvania and its tax climate and how it can and should be improved. Well, I think the survey, survey that has us down around the bottom is the right is one. Is the right one? Yeah. We're, I was going to ask that, but I... <laughs> well, we're, I'll, I'll answer it. Uh, we're amongst the highest tax... I think they just got rid of the, of the capital stock tax, yeah, which inhibited out. Yeah. A, lot mm -hmm. of, a lot of uh, industries in Pennsylvania, they causing them maybe to move out or other or ones not, not to here. come in here. Exactly. And, uh, but it's, we're here. We're not going anywhere. We have two breweries here and, you know, I'm not going anywhere. So you, it just, it eats into your profitability that you could reinvest in your, in your people mm -hmm. or, or your, your plant itself. Uh, so maybe you do something down in Tampa, which uh, is where our third plant is. We bought that in the, in the year 2000. And uh, so you might reinvest down there where you wouldn't invest in Pennsylvania. You know, this is, we've been here so long that this is obviously our, our, well, it's not our biggest state anymore. It used to be, but Florida is now. And, uh, uh, but, but it, it should be our biggest state. Mm -hmm. But the, you, they've inhibited businesses to move out. They've caused them to move out of this state. And they've stopped others from moving in, in my opinion. And this is, this is where we make our money up here in Pennsylvania. This is, this should be our biggest state, and it's not because the population isn't there. Oh, boy. A couple of questions, um, Dick, about um, this uh, liquor reform that we've just undergone in Harrisburg. Um, do you, how did the beer get treated? How are the breweries treated in regard to wine and spirits? What do you think about the uh, outcome of the well, liquor uh, reform at this point? Yeah, I, I, I kind of think that they, the, the legislator, which there's too many of, uh, that's part of our, that's what part of our problem. <laughs> We've talked about that. That's yeah. part of our problem in this state, that the, mm -hmm. it's, it's more costly to run the government in this state than it is anywhere else. But uh, so the answer to the question is, we had to make beer more consumer friendly, and I, I understand the putting it in grocery stores and convenience stores is the right thing to do to give people the opportunity to, be, to buy beer there. They didn't treat the beer distributing system very well. They only have beer to sell. A grocery store has 10,000 whatever different items. Yeah. Uh, the beer distributor has cases of beer. Now they they allowed them to sell 12 packs, and then it was six packs, and now they're selling it by the bottle. So what you're doing in the, they've allowed them to do in that respect is, is trade down from a case of beer to a six pack or a bottle if they, if they want and the consumption is down. When the consumption's down the state's losing tax revenue on, on beer. Every state has its own 
state tax on beer as well as the federal government, which is about half of the cost of a case of beer, mm -hmm. the taxes, federal and state taxes. I can't understand why consumption's down when the number of microbreweries seems to be going through the roof around Pennsylvania. The number of microbreweries has, has really grown, and it's, and it's been a great thing, quite honestly, I, I, because it's introduced consumers to new brands of beer, new styles of beer. Uh, the, the thing is that they're very expensive. If you sit at a bar and drink a, a glass of uh, one of the micro beers, you're probably paying seven, anywhere from six to eight dollars a glass for it. How many glasses can you drink? At that, at that price, and yeah. how long do you stay there? Yes. Our beers are sessionable. Our beers are like the national national brands, and uh, uh, cost-wise, I'm talking about. And you can sit there with a group of people and enjoy yourself, and stay in the bar, maybe have eat, eat food, but they lose their customer. And I think that's that's these guys that are focused on all craft beers. I think are making a mistake, but that's it's their business, and they'll survive or go by the wayside based on the, on the traffic that they get. Well, a last question that we'd like to uh, ask you before we go out in the plant, and that is, how did you survive during Prohibition? During Prohibition, so many breweries disappeared. Uh, I remember going through a winery up in the Finger Lakes, Gold Seal, and they were saying, well, we just continue to do uh, wine, uh, grape juice, with a little, uh, with a little uh, tag on, do not do this or it will ferment. <laughs> how well, did, how we did, didn't do that. How did Yingling <laughs> stay alive during Prohibition? Well, we continued to operate. And, and uh, what my, my grandfather made the comment to one of his, his sons, he said, this is going to last 15, 20 years. And he, at that time, built a dairy across the street and gave one of his sons ran the dairy. They, they bottled milk and they made ice cream over there. And that ran from 1920 till uh, 1985. His son closed it. But uh, we made regular beer, we fermented it, and then we had a, a, a piece of machinery in the brew house that after it was fermented in the cellars, it took the alcohol out, and that, of course, went down the drain, which you couldn't do today. I don't know what you'd do with it. But uh, anyway, we made real beer and de-alcoholized it. But you were also allowed to sell beer to a pharmacy at that time because a doctor could prescribe porter to a pregnant woman, say, what, well, drink one or two bottles a day, and it's good for you. But we, we can't sell beer under no. that premise <laughs> anymore. But uh, oh, that's the trouble. way they made it. And they also transformed a lot of his employees that because we didn't sell the beer during Prohibition that we did before, so a lot of the employees went across the street and got jobs at the dairy, so he kept his people working. And, and Coors did the same thing. They got into uh, uh, porcelain or something out there. I think they still make porcelain. Oh. So they, they kept their people working. But owners were very, family-owned companies are very loyal to their em employees. The uh, corporate America is not. They would have just closed it down. But he kept open, and uh, after Prohibition, which you said about St. Louis and all the people out there, trucks were lined around the whole brewery for 12 blocks <laughs> the day at midnight when Prohibition ended. And, I, and they loaded everything by hand, so it had to, I'm glad I wasn't a part of that generation. And your brewery, when Prohibition ended, you sent a, a, a case of beer to FDR? A wagon, a wagon a load. A wagon load of so beer did, to FDR so did to August, celebrate. So did Gus Bush. He did the same thing. I think all breweries sent beer down to Washington. That's why they celebrated down there. They were all imbibing. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, just in 30 seconds, what's the future for Yingling? Well, I think we have a great future. Uh, the, way, the way the craft breweries have introduced uh, the, the consumer to new brands and not just the kind of blah, sold on television national brands, uh, we make a, a, a great selection of beers with ales, porter, uh, Oktoberfest, the lager brand, the light lager brand. And uh, we, there's the we, summer wheat. The summer okay, wheat. I'm we make dying that. To try that. And <laughs> and we make a, a great portfolio of products. And and I just think that the consumers used to buying those today. And you know we we think our future is very bright. Uh, we've expanded our marketing from just Pennsylvania and New Jersey to Delaware, all the way out to Indiana now, which we can service. And uh, 
we're, we've grown tremendously. We're up to almost sure two point right. seven. Yeah, I think yeah. it is. We're up to almost two point seven million barrels, and that's quite an accomplishment. From uh, when I bought it, it was one hundred thirty-seven thousand barrels, so we're doing pretty well. Wow. Now, for the last five years, we've gone down to Florida just for a week in January, and everyone is drinking Yingling, but a few people can pronounce it properly. Yeah. <laughs> That's why we Everybody's call it drinking. lager. That's <laughs> why I said just call it lager. Yeah. It's very simple. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, we want to thank you so much for being with us today. All right, we'll be back with our second segment uh, right after this. Behind the Headlines is brought to you as a public service by the Hospital and Health System Association of Pennsylvania, helping hospitals provide healing, health, and hope to communities across the state. And by the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry. The Pennsylvania Chamber serves as the frontline advocate for business on Pennsylvania's Capitol Hill by influencing the legislative, regulatory, and judicial branches of state government. Additional underwriting provided by the Worrell Corporation Foundation, based in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, by the Edward H. and Jeannie Arnold Foundation, and by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Business in Pennsylvania is our business. Behind the Headlines is also supported as a public service by the Pennsylvania Highway Information Association, the go-to source to learn about transportation projects and issues. Visit pahighwayinfo.org. Welcome back to the second half of Behind the Headlines. Maura and I are on location uh, in um, Pottsville, Pennsylvania, and we are at the Yingling Brewery with Dick Yingling. Uh, Dick, um, you have done such a great job guiding Yingling in this modern era. Uh, we were wondering, has state government ever approached you about serving on some boards or commissions to try to go to Harrisburg and make them more efficient, more effective? Oh no, they don't want. No, I don't know if they want to be more efficient. Uh, <laughs> but no, they've never approached me for anything like that. But uh, what, a, what a waste! What a, what a lost opportunity well, they don't on their part. They don't listen to business people. They they're running their own agenda. Two political parties that are going in different directions, and it's it's kind of a shame, and we all suffer for it. Uh, but uh, in some respects, they do a good job. But there's uh, just too many, and it's everything gets too political anymore. Nobody works together. I wouldn't want to be a part of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was just surprised because I know there have been uh, other businessmen who have uh, chipped in at, at one time or another, and I thought for sure uh, that uh, somebody should have asked you by now. Um, Nobody so. ever recruited you for public office? I'm glad they didn't. No. no. <laughs> no. Yeah, did you ever think of, of no. running for no, sir. state <laughs> senate or governor? No, sir. I have not. <laughs> you, well, you'd win. <laughs> well, one of the other interesting things about your brewery is the fact that you are a family-run business and you have four wonderful young daughters who are preparing to take over from you someday, although I believe it was a Forbes profile on you that said, oh, you'll still be here at 100. Uh, and uh, <laughs> that uh, you know, you're a hands-on kind of owner that loves the business and loves the employees and loves the community. And that's why a big key to the success of Yingling. But I uh, wondered if you could talk a little bit about how you've set up a succession uh, from yourself to your daughters? Well, because of inheritance taxes and what, what, what uh, we started with, what I paid for the brewery from my father in 85 and what it's worth today is uh, there's a lot of insurance on the table, that's all I can tell you. It's the only way to pass it on. It's really not fair uh, to, for a family business. A lot of them can't survive. They, they haven't thought ahead and, and uh, taken out insurance so that you can pay the taxes on the increased value of the of the business mm -hmm. or you'd be broke or you wouldn't have any money to reinvest in the business so it, it really isn't fair and it's very difficult for family businesses to go generation by generation if they last three generations you're very fortunate and you're, we're going into six i have nine grandchildren and hopefully it'll go at least seven so <laughs> well, it'll be at least seven i hope yeah. And I guess you've, but you've schooled them in the fact that beer has traditionally been one of the historic industries in Pennsylvania. Uh, it was huge in Pennsylvania years ago. All the small coal region towns all had their own breweries and uh, most of them were very successful. 
Uh, but as time went on, as I said, it's hard to pass it on to a next generation. Maybe then in some cases there wasn't another generation. They had just all closed up. We're the last one standing, basically. And all four daughters are involved in the uh, All four, now. two full-time. Wendy and Jennifer, which you'll meet, uh, are here full-time. And Debbie and uh, Cheryl are, are here part-time. They fill in the, for vacations for the uh, people. And they, they all do a good job, whether they're here full-time or part-time. They're That's all good. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, I'm proud of them. Great. Well, as we close the, the show, I was wondering if you could um, sort of share some of your thoughts and your expertise with the folks uh, in Harrisburg and around the Commonwealth. How can manufacturing, basically manufacturing, um, flourish in Pennsylvania? How can we continue to be the Keystone State and continue to have that strong manufacturing base in, uh, without losing it to China? In the last minute, we we have to we have to uh, invite businesses into the state with uh, lower taxes. Give them a tax break. You'll make it up with jobs, getting people off of welfare and and employing. And you have to give these people a place to work. So you have to develop a plant or make a plant or take a vacant plant and uh, revitalize it. Cut down on the rules where we've been ruled to death by the past administration with uh, seven thousand new rules that we have to follow and it. It just inhibits our business. It's why businesses go to Mexico or China, and it's cheaper to import it. It's, it's wrong, totally wrong. Okay, well, thank you very much. We appreciate you spending time with us today and with our audience throughout the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and we look forward to coming back in the near future. Thanks very I much hope again, I'm still Dick. here. Yeah, <laughs> we do too. Sure you will be, and we hope you'll be here again next week to see a new episode of Behind the Headlines. We'll see you then.